Well, this morning, we've come to our third week of our series, walking through and studying together the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. And uh, I'm so thankful for uh, Chris's message this past week, uh, so, uh, past Sunday, so that I was able to attend the ESCA Theology Conference. It was a tremendous blessing to be together with uh, 400 pastors or so and uh, to worship together, to learn together, to study together. And uh, Chris's concluding application that we uh, get to Jesus as quick as we can, get to Jesus as quick as you can, will have tremendous application and connect very, very much with what we're going to be talking about this morning. Now, I've titled this series, The Fingerprints of Christian Authenticity, because the letters of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John provide a series of tests that show the difference between the real thing and what profoundly isn't when it comes to following Christ. And you say, test of genuineness. And when I think about test of genuineness, a couple of tests come to mind that I personally experienced. And one was, uh, a number of years ago, I was selling a car. And the car was, it was pretty much done, so it was a pretty cheap car to sell. And we then posted an ad online, and as I was selling this, this car, uh, someone came and said they'd like to look at the car, and they said they'd like to look at the car, and I said, well, first person with cash gets it. Uh, but I started getting the feeling that this was a little bit of an uncomfortable situation, and as he brought uh, the bills uh, to, to me to pay for it, and uh, you know, I was going to sign over the title, I says, hey, no offense here, but I'm just going to check the watermark on all these bills. And uh, he was pretty cool about it, uh, but what he, he said next made me... Uh, uh, feel very assured in the, that I was making the right decision to check the bills, to say the very least. He says, well, if they're not good, I have more. And I said, I'll, I'll check extra. <laughs> Checking the authenticity. And I was like, I think my negative, my concerns here are confirmed. Um, when Melissa and I were dating, bef uh, shortly before we got engaged, I uh, uh, was going to get an engagement ring. Uh, but we had a, we have, uh, Melissa has it now, but it, we had a diamond in our family that had gone back to uh, the 1880s. Uh, so I took this diamond to a couple of different jewelers uh, to talk about what it would look like to get this set. And I went first to a jewelry store in a mall, and they go, we don't even know what this is. We don't even know if this is a real diamond, because it looks di a little bit different. The cut is just nothing we've ever seen. And I says, it's because it's well more than 100 years old. Uh, so I, I learned my lesson and didn't go to the jewelry store in the mall, but found a real jeweler with a real gemologist, an expert in gems. And what he did is he immediately took the rock, took it over to uh, the microscope, turned it, and goes, this is really neat. This is a, a, a miner's cut diamond. I love these things. This goes back, I would say, 1880s, and just told me so many things that I couldn't ever really know, and uh, then took me over to a catalog and showed me you know, what kind of settings we could get, and of course, uh, that all worked out great. But again, there was tests of genuineness. The first thing that uh, they wanted to know is, you have this rock that you say is a diamond, but maybe it isn't. Uh, of course, indeed it is, but there was needing to be a test of genuineness. And, and with that in mind, this morning we're going to be turning to chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, and everything is wrapped around this truth. A lifestyle characterized by obedience to God's commands is a mark of genuineness. And claiming to know God while living a lifestyle of persistent disobedience suggests that we don't truly know God, that, in fact, that we are, in fact, lying. I'll read the passage again. This is chapter 2. Verses 1 through 6. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And by this we know that we have come to know him uh, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word... In him, truly, the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Uh, did you catch that, uh, the theme of our obedience, or unfortunately, po possibly the lack of it, telling the truth about us? Verse 3 says, And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Uh, the theme of knowing, 
Knowing that we know that we know, or assurance of our salvation, knowing that we have eternal life, is center, it's front and center in the, the letter of 1 John. And so, okay, with that in mind, let's jump into the passage together. And we'll first of all see that honesty about our continuing struggle with sin must not be allowed to turn into an excuse for or rationalization of our sin. And right away, the chapter begins with these words, my little children. And it's worth pausing to consider and remember that John was quite old when he wrote 1 John. And with that in mind, it makes sense that his tone, the tone that he speaks in, shines through, and it's a loving, enduring, and fatherly way of speaking. Uh, These words show the depth of his love, care, and concern. And then immediately after, we read, my little children. Can you sense that, that fatherly compassion? But right after we read those words, we read this also in verse 1. I'm writing these things uh, to you so that you may not sin. Now that probably leaves some of us saying to ourselves, wait a minute. Because in chapter 1 we saw that genuineness necessarily means honesty about in confession of our sin not denial or minimization of it. Uh, Chapter 1, verses 8 through 10 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Claiming to be without sin, which, by the way, is exactly what the false teachers were claiming, is lying. And even worse than that, such bogus claims actually are calling God a liar and His gospel a lie. And I hope we see that we do not want to go there. Verse 8 says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So chapter 1 ends reminding us that a fingerprint of authenticity, or a mark of genuineness, if you will, is not denying our sin, but acknowledging and confessing it. And that brings us to the glorious gospel promise found in verse 9. A glorious promise indeed. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you see, we have to be careful. Because claiming... The wonderful promise of forgiveness, which is indeed glorious. and It is tremendously glorious. It is indescribably glorious. But we must not fall into the trap of, a, of twisting that into a license to sin. Uh, see, uh, think with me and see if you can uh, see where I'm coming from. It's a glorious promise. But if you're wondering how does it fit with, I am writing, writing these things to you so that you may not sin, think about it. A wonderful gospel gospel promise of forgiveness can be twisted and misapplied into a license to sin. And the logic can go like this. Well, it's okay, because after all, we'll be forgiven. I won't ask for a show of hands if you said that or thought that. We've probably encountered this kind of deadly reasoning before. And John, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, pleads with us not to fall into this deadly and deeply wrong thinking. The reality is, is that though we shouldn't sin, we know that we do. We struggle with sin more than we'd ever be comfortable admitting and more than we even understand. There's not a day that goes by that we avoid sin as we should. Our hearts lead us astray. They've been described well in the language of the Reformation as idol factories. And that's right, our hearts are idol factories. Jeremiah 17.9 says it this way, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? We might not at first want to embrace that truth. But once we do, it makes perfect sense of the battleground, which is our lives and our hearts, isn't it? You know what I'm talking about? The struggle that we all experience. However, with all of that said, we're to be holy as God's people, in sin is a very big deal. And we must never allow ourselves to excuse our sin or, and to make excuses for it 
uh, or to call it anything less than the cosmic treason that it is. It's treason against our Creator. What is sin? It's rebellion against our Creator who made us. Our Creator who rightfully demands and deserves our worship. And sin is treason against Him. Sin is a very big deal. Also, back in chapter 1, we read that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin in verse 7. When we see these promises, we should rightly, rightfully tremble with wonder. But we must never allow these promises to be twisted and I do mean twisted that's not what you know chapter one read rightly will not go here but we can twist it don't twist it into a light view of sin one that says ah it's no big deal we've got to see our sin for what it is Jesus in John 5 14 so the gospel of John says this right after he healed a man he said see you are well sin no more that nothing worse may happen to you so coming out of this, uh, you know, sort of this discussion of sin, we're, we're led to a question that we all have to face. And it's simply this. Have I been downplaying the seriousness of my sin? Am I excusing or downplaying or minimizing my sin? And I would encourage all of us to pause and to consider. Am I lying to myself and saying, oh, my persistent rebellion is no big deal? It is. It cost our Savior His life. He shed His blood. Well, let's continue moving through the passage and facing the reality and horror of our sin confronts us with our need for Jesus Christ. He is the propitiation for our sins. And so with all that in mind, verses 1 and 2 take us to the solution uh, for our sin. We're told that Jesus Christ, the righteous, is our advocate with God the Father. And I'd point out that the Greek word describing the ministry of Jesus that we translate advocate is parakletos, and that's the same word that appears in the final chapters of the Gospel of John describing the ministry of the then promised in coming Holy Spirit. In the upper room discourse, he's described as the paraclete. And a paraclete literally means one called alongside to help. Jesus is our advocate before God the Father. He takes up our defense. 1 Timothy 2.5 says it this way, For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Hebrews describes Jesus' ministry as our great high priest. And when we unpack all of this, when we begin to unpack all of this, we realize that Jesus Christ alone is uniquely qualified for this ministry on our behalf. Think about it. Him, Jesus, and Jesus alone is the only one to ever live a perfect, sinless life and to die the death that we deserve as sinners, but He alone did not deserve as our substitute. He died the death that was the just reward for our sins. Hebrews 4.15 says this, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, get this, yet without sin. And with all of that in mind, let's examine the word that the English Standard Version translates propitiation, uh, the New International Version translates atoning sacrifice. There's a tremendously rich gospel meaning here. The, the English Standard Version and several older translations translate propitiation here in chapter 2, verse 2, and in also chapter 4 and verse 10. Ver, uh, verse 2, He is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And 4.10, and this is love, not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Now, ordinarily, I'm all for using words that are part of our everyday vocabulary. 
And I realized that propitiation is probably not an everyday term. It's probably not one you're planning to use at lunch. But I need to make an exception because this term is full of rich and important meaning. It means a sacrifice turning aside God's wrath. Jesus' is atoning, Jesus is atoning sacrifice for our sins moves us from punishment to forgiveness, from wrath to mercy. Without Christ's sacrifice applied to our account, God's wrath would remain upon us because of our sin. John 3.36 says exactly this. Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remain, remains on him. Or think about the lyrics of the modern hymn, In Christ Alone. Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. For every sin on Him was laid. Here in the death of Christ I live. We're not simply dirty needing to be washed. It's much worse than that. Much, much worse than that. By default, we're God's enemies and justly under His holy, righteous wrath. You know, sometimes when we think of sin, we think of the idea like of a kid who goes out and plays in the mud and needs to be washed. And, and don't get me wrong, we need to be washed. But the picture is more and it's deeper and it's worse than that. We're not just dirty. We are. Our sin makes us dirty. But actually, the default human condition is an enemy of God and justly under His holy, righteous wrath because of our sin. And then we come to the words, and not, only, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And the theme of the world is also found in the Gospel of John, chapter 1 and verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Or probably the best known words in the entire Bible, John 3, 16 and 17. For God so loved the world, again, you hear that key phrase, that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through Him. Now let's think carefully. Obviously, as we think about that phrase, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Obviously, this can't mean that everyone is saved. We just saw that those who reject the Son are under God's wrath. That said, what this means is glorious. Jesus' sacrifice is sufficient. Nothing ever needs to be added to it. On the cross, what did he say? He said, it is finished. Jesus' atoning sacrifice is complete, and there is nothing lacking in it. His sacrificial death is sufficient for all, but only effective in those who believe. And obviously, this has to be the case because not all are saved. Now, with all of that said, I think we need some clear and very straightforward and honest thinking about our sins in Christ's atoning sacrifice. Friends, there are only a couple of categories we can fall into. And one is that our sins are covered. And the word atonement means covering. If you hear anything I say, hear this. For our sins to be covered, we need to look to Christ in His atoning sacrifice with confidence as the basis of our salvation. And notice, our confidence is not in ourselves. It is in Christ and what He has done on the cross. In His continuing ministry in the Father's presence as our High Priest and Advocate. Our Evangelical Free Church Statement of Faith has this phrase speaking about Jesus. See if you can hear the verses I just read. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father as our High Priest and Advocate. Jesus speaks to the Father in our defense, on our behalf, when we sin, uh, when we sin, uh, and He speaks to the Father on our behalf when we fall into sin on the basis of His finished work on the cross. He is the propitiation for our sins. I said the one option is that our sins are covered, right? The only other option is that our sins are not covered. If you do not yet believe, 
The free offer of forgiveness has been extended and offered to you, but it's not yours if you haven't personally received it. And if this is you, your situation is dire. You are under God's wrath. That's a tremendously strong statement, I know, and it's absolutely true. And I don't want any of us to face God's just, righteous, holy wrath for all eternity. Perhaps today, you need to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior and ask Him to give you the eternal life on the basis of what He did as your substitute on the cross. I plead with you, do not wait. Repent of your sin and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and tell us that that's what you have done. There's an old phrase, and it's absolutely right. It's a strong one, but it's right. Flee the wrath to come. If you haven't yet acknowledged your sin and asked Him to save you, today should be the day. Please don't put this decision off because we don't know how long we have in this life. Okay, continuing. Let's try to put all of this together. We absolutely need to realize that sin is extremely serious. And, if you, and even for believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we continue to struggle and do battle with sin. If you're honest with yourself, you know what I mean. You know that your heart is a war zone. Do You agonize over it. Do you know what I'm talking about? The war within us. And friends, as we fight that battle... We must flee excuses and rationalizations. We're called to holiness. 1 Peter 1.16 says it this way, You shall be holy, for I am holy. So we must never excuse sin. We must never rationalize sin. We must never say it's no big deal. On the other hand, flee any teaching that says we can be perfect in this life. We can't. The struggle in our hearts will continue until glory. And then it will be over. But in this life, we will never be perfect. The struggle with sin will never be over. We should grow and experience more victory. But never over. the struggle is never over. Genuine followers of Jesus are not perfect, but rather growing. We acknowledge and confess our sin. We don't deny or minimize it. In building on all of this, we must never allow ourselves to think that our sin is no big deal. Our Lord shed His blood. And when we pause and consider that, we have been blood-bought, we see the seriousness of our sin, don't we? Allow me to share a story. While I was in seminary, I worked for a park district as a supervisor for a couple of different summers. And at one point, an employee of mine crashed our John Deere Gator into a tree. The vehicle was carrying a lot of water uh, to put out a a controlled burn that uh, that we were doing at the park, and he was driving way too fast and lost control, and truly, it was a blessing he didn't kill himself or his passenger because there was a significant embankment, and the tree that he T-boned probably kept him from going over the embankment and ending up with a John Deere Gator on top of both of them. Things easily and obviously could have ended very differently and been much worse. That said, the vehicle ended up with significant damage. Now, let me ask you, what did my employee deserve? He deserved to be fired on the spot, Driving irresponsibly was and is grounds for uh, termination. No question about it. And what did he want? He wanted to hear those words that maybe we've said before, oh, it's no big deal. It's okay. Well, he got neither of those things. Things were taken care of. The vehicle was fixed, and he was given a serious warning. We didn't treat him as he deserved, but we didn't let him go saying it's not a big deal. And when it comes to sin... When we trust Christ, we are saved and we cross from death to life. The moment you trust Christ, you cross over from death to life. And we don't get what we deserve. We're forgiven. And the very next thing that I ought to say is this, and we must never allow ourselves to say or think about our sin. It's no big deal. 
It's a huge deal. Our sin cost Jesus' his life. And considering that this helps us understand the words of verse 1. I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I learned these words in the 1984 New International Version. But if anyone does sin, if anybody does sin, we, ha- uh, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense. Praise God, because of Christ's death, we don't have to get what we deserve. Let's turn to verses 3 through 6, and we'll see that genuineness shows itself in lives characterized by obedience. And by this we know that we have come to know him if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. And the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God has been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. Friends, our obedience or lack of obedience to Jesus' commands, tells the truth about us. This is a test of genuineness or or authenticity. And it's possible, we've got to understand, it's possible for our pious claims to be utterly contradicted by our conduct. I want us to look again and look closely at verse 3. And as I read, listen for the theme of knowing. It's a theme running throughout 1 John. And by this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. This should give us assurance if we should have assurance. And this should not give us assurance if we shouldn't. Obedience as a pattern of life or a lifestyle, a way of life, gives evidence to the fact that one is born again. It's the lifestyle test. Does a professing Christian have a changed life? We must. The question, do I know God? Knowing God is more than knowledge about Him. Not less, but more. Knowing God is having a relationship with Him, and we can know that we know God if we keep His commandments. But on the other hand, those who claim to know God but ignore His commandments are liars. They do not know God. That is painfully clear. And you say, that, is that really what it says? Yes, listen again to verse 4. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So there's, this claim, there's these claims that the false teachers had been making. In chapter 1, they'd claimed to be without sin. And claiming to be without sin means you're fake, right? You're phony. You're not real. In here... Claiming to know God but not obey, again, what does that say? Talk is cheap. You're fake. Let's unpack all of this a little bit more. The theme of obedience to God runs throughout the Gospel of John as well as the letter of 1 John. And here are just a few highlights. Jesus says in John 14, 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. Or 1510, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. And then 1 John 5, 3, for this is the love of, uh, for this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments, and His commandments are not burdensome. And this leaves us asking, what exactly is obedience to His commandments? And to answer this question, I'm going to turn over to chapter 3 uh, in verse 23 here in 1 John, and this is His commandment that we believe in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as He commanded us. So here, obedience to God's command, uh, commands is summed up, or, or you know, summarized in two things, belief in Jesus and love for one another. And the theme of love will come to the forefront, Lord willing, next week when we look at verses 7 through 11 of chapter 2. And then in verse 6, this test of obedience is restated again in different words. Whoever says he abides in Him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. I'll say that again. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So what's obedience? Obedience isn't just being full of talk. It's walking as Jesus did. It's loving as Jesus loved. Modeling Jesus' compassion for those in need. It's all that and much more. Following Jesus in the way of the cross. And Jesus himself said, deny your cross, take, up and fo- take it up and follow me. And whenever we talk about obedience, it's important to make sure 
that we understand exactly what we mean. Think with me. I have a question for you. Think carefully now. This could be a trick question. Is there anything we can do to make God love us? Is there anything we can do to make God love us? Please, please, please say no. Everything flows from the cross where Jesus died as our atoning sacrifice. We love because He first loved us. Everything flows from the cross where Jesus died as our atoning sacrifice. Christ died for our sins. And knowing God is not a legalistic list of do's and don'ts. There is nothing we can, make, we can do to make God love us. And we need to be clear about this. Because that's what some think, that's what comes to mind for some when we hear the word obedience. Our minds wander to a legalistic code uh, that, following Jesus, that makes following Jesus sound like a checklist of do's and don'ts. No, we relate to the Lord Jesus Christ solely on the basis of grace, totally unmerited favor. It's not a list of checking the boxes of doing these things and avoiding those things. On the other hand, twisting God's grace into a license to sin is denying the faith as well. Remember, sin is a big deal and it cost Jesus his life. We must resist the pools of legalism on the one hand, which makes following Jesus into a list of do's and don'ts that we check the boxes and we end up pleading our performance, not the Lord Jesus Christ in His atoning sacrifice. We say, see, look what I did. And friends, we cannot save ourselves. So that would be the pull on the one side, legalism, but we must resist the pull on the other side of license saying, well, because I'll be forgiven, it doesn't matter. Does it? Oh, yes, it does. It matters big time. We've been blood-bought. How serious is our sin? Our Savior shed His blood. Here's what we need to understand, putting this all together. We can contradict our claim to know God by our behavior. These verses remind us that we must love God enough to obey Him. And obviously, this is not this does not mean perfection because that's not possible until heaven. But the direction of our lives is very important. Failing to obey and seeing it as, eh, no big deal, is deadly serious. We can tell ourselves, it's no big deal that I'm harboring bitterness, that I get drunk, that I'm engaged in premarital sex, that I'm living with my boyfriend or girlfriend, that my mouth ought to be washed out with soap, that I'm disobeying God about his command to be in fellowship with other Christians, you name it, that I'm failing to be truthful, and that I'm regularly lying and saying, oh, it's just white lies. Cleaning up our act isn't going to save us. And honestly, we have no hope of cleaning up our act without God's transforming work in our lives in the first place. We can't clean up our act without the Holy Spirit working within us. That said, Continually growing obedience to God's command is evidence of genuineness, and sadly, the opposite is also true. Having an I don't care attitude toward God's commands is evidence of phoniness, and there's enormous application here. This test of obedience helps us recognize false teachers, and in the world of 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John, there were a lot of them. And they were and are savage wolves pretending to be sheep masquerading around in sheep's clothing. And the test of obedience helps us recognize what's really going on. Friends, hear me very clearly. Don't follow someone who is supposedly a Christian leader if there is nothing but bad fruit everywhere. Yes, leaders are sinners too, but a mark of being real is acknowledging and confessing our sin. And on top of all of this, this helps us an answer the question, probably a nagging question that all of us have faced at one point or another. How do I know that I'm real? These words have bearing on how we view assurance of salvation. And there are a couple of extremes to avoid. 
One extreme is simply this. I'm not advocating for this, but maybe you've heard it. Maybe you've said it. I went forward. I was saved. I prayed a prayer. Even though nothing has changed, I'm good. We need to be aware of this. Uh, uh, we need to be aware of this because it's possible to lie, and even in lying, to wrongly convince ourselves, and that's scary. Verse three tells us that we can know that we know Him if we keep His commands. And obviously, this is not perfection, but it is a changed life. If we're real, we should have assurance. If we read this passage and you are genuinely a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ, you should have tremendous, wonderful assurance of salvation and praise God. But if it's all talk and it's not real, this should not give you assurance. This should say, you need to be real. Talk is cheap. On the other hand, so there, now there is a, another trap we can fall into, and I just want to talk about this real quick as we conclude. On the other hand, having an oversensitive conscience and lacking any real assurance of salvation is also tremendously unhealthy. You don't want to cheapen it, but we don't want to be overly, have a, such an overly sensitive conscience that you go, I, I don't know. No, we can know. 1 John was written so that we may know that we have eternal life. The good news is Christ's sacrifice is sufficient for sins past, present, and future. Friends, we can have rock-solid confidence in what our Savior has done for us. Our confidence must not be in ourselves, but in Him and what He has done for us. 1 John should provide rock-solid, grounded assurance of salvation Unless, of course, it shouldn't. I think that's a good way to say it. We should have rock-solid assurance unless, of course, we shouldn't because we're not real, not genuine, the tests of genuineness. Well, we've covered a lot of ground today. We've seen that honesty about our continuing struggle with sin must not be allowed uh, to turn into an excuse for a rationalization of our sin. That facing the reality and horror of our sin confronts us with our need for Jesus. He is the propitiation for our sins, a sacrifice turning aside the wrath of God. Oh, how we need salvation, the salvation that is offered in the Lord Jesus Christ and Him alone. And we've seen that our obedience, our lack of obedience to Jesus' commands tells the truth about us. Please pray with me and then we'll close in song. Heavenly Father, we thank You that in love You sent Your one and only Son so that we can be saved. Lord, I pray that as we considered and continue to consider and ponder walking out the doors this morning, the wonder of the gospel, I pray that it would cause us to tremble and lead us into worship. The wonder of not getting what I deserve for my sins. The wonder of propitiation. The, the wonder of the gospel. And Lord, through the power of your Holy Spirit, increase in us a desire to grow in obedience and to experience ever continuing and growing victory over sin. We know it won't be complete in this life, but we want to grow in our relationship with you, Lord Jesus, our Savior. And it's in your name that we pray. Amen.